an Archaeodeath publication review. Hey there Archaeodeathlings and welcome to another Archaeodeath video and I've taken you out and about, I've done some monthly reflections and uh, I've also talked about some specific themes in my research. Um, I want to now give you another of my publication reviews and now I take you all the way back to the noughties, to 2009 when I co-edited and published with University of Exeter Press and subsequently in paperback with University of Liverpool Press this book with Dr Duncan Sayer, now Professor Duncan Sayer of the University of Central Lancashire, Mortuary Practices and Social Identities in the Middle Ages. Um, this book uh, contains uh, 13 fascinating case studies in mortuary archaeology. I want to take you through this book and give you a little bit of an introduction to it in case you wanted to utilise it for your studies um, um, or indeed acquire it for pleasant leisurely reading. Whatever you do with it, I hope this video serves as a little bit of an introduction to a book which I'm very proud of, from the front cover to the last page and even the back cover, and uh, contains some interesting work on mortuary archaeology. Now, uh, the book uh, has a context to it. It was um, set up at the time when we were saying goodbye to a very charismatic and influential funerary archaeologist Dr Heinrich Herker um, of the University of Reading and Duncan and I were both his students. There he is in his uh, happy uh, German helmet uh, and his lovely moustache of course. Um, and it, the, the, the subtitle of the book as well as being called Mortuary Practices and Social Identities in the Middle Ages was Essays in Burial Archaeology in Honour of Heinrich Herker. And so our introduction, co um, lead edited by me, but, uh, lead, lead authored by me um, with Duncan it's called Halls of Mirrors, Death and Identity in Medieval Archaeology. And 11 years on, I think it still serves as a, a useful introduction to different approaches and perspectives in the uh, archaeology of death, um, drawing from Heinrich's work and surveying his contributions to um, the study of early medieval archaeology, particularly looking at issues of migration and ethnogenesis, um, approaches to material and place, in burial archaeology, but also Heinrich's work looking at modern politics and his work looking at sort of the relationship between German archaeology and its uh, dangerous and uh, problematic past. Um, so we have those different perspectives of um, reviewing Heinrich's work and then bringing it up to the book in which we have prehistoric perspectives, continental and Scandinavian perspectives, and then looking at issues of medieval identity. And we do that having organised a sort of farewell event for Heinrich in 2007 at the University of Reading. Um, and this, is, this was basically, to use the term, this is a, a festschrift, but uh, as colleagues at Reading were keen to uh, um, rapidly call it a hunshrift. Um, given the nickname of, uh, of, of uh, uh, Heinrich as the Hun in the uh, British archaeological fraternity and particularly at Reading. Um, maybe not the most respectful of terms, but one which he embraced and uh, in a sense of good humour. Um, and uh, he, he, he took to his retirement where he now um, works in Russia. Um, so he hasn't really retired at all, really, but he's retired from Brit the British university system and in good time before it has become even more challenging and difficult for all of us working in the, over the last decade. And it continues to be so with the commercialisation uh, of uh, um, the, the, the university system and the ever increasing pressures upon us as teachers, researchers and, and administrators. So I think... Uh, Heinrich was canny to get out when he did, perhaps. I think he didn't, certainly wouldn't have enjoyed himself working in the 2020s in the UK university system. I, I think that's fair to say. Now, what can I say about the contents of the book? Well, um, I said the, I've given you an uh, insight into the introduction. Then we have Bob Chapman's Working with the Dead chapter, which takes a prehistoric perspective on the social approaches to funerary archaeology. Um, then we have a, a wonderful chapter complementing that from another prehistorian, Richard Bradley, who takes a British prehistoric perspective on the Anglo-Saxon poem Beowulf and offers us some of the archaeology behind the themes and tropes in death rituals we find in that legendary epic poem. 
And then we jump to the continent and um, um, Stefan Burmeister looks at uh, Roman Iron Age uh, northern Germany and elite burials, what we've contended to consider elite burials um, of Germanic princes, as he, with a scare quote, and provides an alternative perspective on their interpretation, not as evidence of a clear and static rigorous hierarchy, but a more fluid um, relationships uh, between the Roman Empire and its uh, frontiers and elites rising at various points um, in, in the uh, Roman Iron Age. Then Susanna Harkenbeck, who is of, of now, as many will be aware, is at the University of Cambridge um, and is a lecturer there. Um, she looks at Hunnic modified skulls and presents her interpretations of those modified skulls in uh, Bavaria. And um, she then interprets them as potentially related to issues of transformative um, societies during times of migration, linking a Hunnic identity with various other conceptualizations of identity and paths of migration through uh, Central um, and Southern Europe. We then jump to Scandinavia where Karen Hoyland Nielsen looks at the evidence from the famous Lindholm Hoyer site near Aalborg um, on Jutland and looks at the evidence of cremation practices uh, and ceremonies revealed in those famous excavations but never fully brought to publication. And she looks at pyre sites, at grave goods, animal bones and pots uh, from those the, 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 uh, the, the, the site, uh, which I still find as a valuable uh, introduction to southern or Jutlandic but also southern Scandinavian cremation practices more broadly. Eva Tata, one of uh, Heinrich's former students, as was I and Duncan, um, um, creates, has a contribution looking at the topography of death, uh, um, looking at uh, intellectual ideas, cognitive ideas about death that may have framed the choices of burial location in the late Iron Age of Scandinavia, looking at issues of barrows, ridges and roads. Then we have a very, um, well, still a timely paper, a very healthily critical approach to um, Ancient DNA and Contemporary DNA Research by Catherine Hills and her chapter is called Anglo-Saxon DNA? Um, now, 11 years later, the debates have moved on and we're in an ancient DNA revolution as was long <laughs> precognized by Heinrich and Catherine in different ways. Um, but I think the need for a critical, healthy view on both modern and ancient DNA studies remains, uh, looms large actually in current discussions. We still need to be very careful of some of the configurations and approaches that we are, we are developing um, in relation to that. So um, those, those are the first eight chapters. Then um, Duncan Sayer, building on his doctoral research, has a chapter on laws, funerals and cemetery organisation, looking at the 7th century in Kent and looking at some of the cemeteries he analysed trying to look at kinship structures within those cemeteries and in particular he looked at the Mill Hill Deal Cemetery as a case study and also he looks at Fingalsham and the chronology of that site in relation to skeletal pathology, grave structures, grave goods and other factors. So a really good example of, sort of internal cemetery organisation and how we can interpret it and he's published subsequent papers on that and has a book forthcoming on that topic. So we then move on to me, chapter 10, on display, envisioning the early Anglo-Saxon dead, where I look at the challenging traditions we inherit of how we visualise furnished graves from 18th and 19th century representations through to museum displays and artistic reconstructions today. Uh, so I'm rather proud of that chapter and it set me up for my future work, uh, subsequent work looking at cremation, how we envisage cremation practices. Um, but I also secured permission from Victor Ambrose to reconstruct for his time team image, uh, which um, was used for the uh, subsequently published, which I edited actually for David Hinton, the Bremer site in Hampshire. Um, and interesting case study because of course the osteological sexing of those burials was up to dispute and the initial interpretation of one of the individuals as female was subsequently changed. But I st that's, that's, that's actually doesn't invalidate the, the power of art in our work to visualise these graves and here um, we have a representation of a male with a female gendered individual represented in Victor's reconstruction and I talk about that and other examples within the chapter um, including one which I, I, I helped design with archaeologist and artist Dr Aaron Watson which appeared on the cover of my 2006 monograph as funeral scene from Swallowcliff Down so um, you can read all about that so that's uh, 
that's taking us through. Oh, yes. Where do we go there? Well, then we have a survey by uh, David Petz. Uh, now, I think Professor David Petz at uh, Durham University. Variation in the British burial rite 400 to 700. So he takes us through a survey based on his doctoral research and subsequent analyses of the evidence at the time, which I think there's some additional sites known, but it's still a valuable contribution. Um, and then uh, the, the much understated uh, Professor Grenville Astle offers us an approach to Anglo-Saxon attitudes. How should post AD 700 burials be interpreted? And this is a really interesting chapter drawing on the work of and reflecting on the work of a range of other scholars, including Andrew Reynolds and Dawn Hadley and John Blair, and reflecting on how we interpret these field cemeteries after the end of furnished burial in the 8th and 9th and um, 10th centuries and how we interpret them away from churches. So I think that's a really interesting uh, case study uh, that perhaps deserves further citation than it has, it has received. And we come to uh, draw to a close of the book with a chapter by Professor Roberta Gilchrist, Rethinking Later Medieval Mas Masculinity, The Male Body in Death. And so she looks at Heinrich's work, which she's used on many of her publications of gender archaeology as an example of how we use biological and social data from funerary archaeology in combination to look at the cultural construction and ritualised expression of gender in the funerary record, and then applies it to the later Middle Ages, looking at both priest burials um, um, in particular in, in relation to warrior burials as in terms of knightly representations in the grave and on funerary sculpture. So she looks at this conflicting secular and clerical masculinities as she conceives it in the commemoration of the late medieval warrior. So all told I'm quite proud of this book. As I said, it has gone into paperback and therefore it's one of the few books I've done uh, that has gone to paperback. So it's more affordable now. I mean, obviously, this is the original University of Exeter um, print, uh, but you can buy it from the University of Liverpool Press at a much cheaper paperback price. So don't get fooled into buying it at high prices online. Uh, and I'm very proud of it as a collection and uh, all credit to Duncan for uh, coming up with the idea and sticking with me as we went through the editing process. And I think it was my third edited book, uh, the, the first one, Archaeology's Remembrance, 2003, then a co-edited collection in 2007 with Sarah Semple, and this is my third one, if I remember rightly. And um, I think it still is a valuable um, textbook for students looking at um, particularly medieval funerary ritual and the theory of funerary, uh, how we interpret funerary ritual in the past. And it, it, it does honour to Dr Heinrich Herker's legacy and his work, but takes using his colleagues and his collaborators and his uh, contemporaries it takes the debate forward in different directions in Scandinavia on continental Europe and in the British Isles looking westwards to uh, um, Western Britain looking at uh, David Petz's contribution but also looking into with my contribution looking into how we represent and uh, uh, interpret burial practices in the contemporary um, culture of, of how we uh, interpret and present that materials to the public and the role of the artist, the problematic role of artists in that process. So that's my little summary of the book. Go away and buy it or read it in, in libraries if you have access and um, uh, just let me know if you have any comments. You know, do subscribe to my channel. Let me know if you have any questions about the book and and oh any feedback if you liked it if you didn't like it what what should there be more of these things what are the gaps that we we should be filling in future research that you can identify because i think there aren't that many edited collections on medieval funerary ritual and there should be more and i certainly can identify all series of yawning areas that need further research so so let's have a dialogue get in touch if you have any comments but certainly subscribe to my channel and i hope to see you soon in future videos if you've enjoyed this Archeo Death video, why not check out the Archeo Death blog at howardwilliamsblog.wordpress.com.